So another thing that should be apparent from those of you looking at us as we're reviewing our department's developments, uh, we all get along. And where does that come from? It comes in part from Lou Judd and comes a great deal. Oh, and, and, and from, of course, Igor Grant, at least on the funny side. So, uh, but uh, Lou Judd and Igor Grant uh, basically have put forth uh, an approach that says, uh, we'd love to have you potentially in our department. Let's take a look briefly, department, at how collegial this person is, uh, and how well they're likely to chip in rather than leave their colleagues kind of hanging in the wind when some uh, issues come up. We all share data with each other. Uh, we all help each other with grants. Well, that's, card, that's part of the introduction to our next speaker, who's Robert Antonelli who is a, a, a wonderful collegial man who I remember from his residency, his work on the alcohol and drug treatment program, his work on acute alcohol challenges, and in um, more recent years while continuing the trying to understand alcohol stress and level of response to alcohol, he has developed a marvelous portfolio of work on tobacco. So his, uh, it gives me great pleasure to have a chance to introduce our, our acting or interim chair and a very good friend, Robert Antonelli. Thanks very much, Mark, and thanks everyone for hanging in there this afternoon. I am Robert Antonelli. I want to start by thanking Mark and Pat and Igor and Sid Zizek, the organizing leaders of this 50th anniversary celebration. They've been working very hard, along with the other members of the organizing committee, on this three-day presentation, and I think it shows. So I'm sure we'll be thanking you, but a thanks to those individuals for putting this all together today. All right, so I'm going to go ahead, and un unlike the other presenters who, who've been here today, I wasn't really born when the department started, but I will forge ahead as best I can, give it... Oh, I'm sorry, somebody, somebody caught me on that. Okay. Uh, before I launch into my talk, which is going to be about the tobacco epidemic, I'd like to acknowledge several other departmental colleagues who work in the nicotine dependence field. And unlike my title, they certainly haven't forgotten, but pointed a spotlight on the importance of tobacco. And I want to start by mentioning Doug Zadonis, who I think people now know as a professor in our department, associate vice chancellor for health sciences, who's really one of the pioneers in the area of smoking in uh, patients with psychiatric disorders. Doug, great to have you here with us at UC San Diego. I also want to mention some other folks who are in the, in the room today, Arthur Brody, Mark Myers, and Neil Doran, not only because of their excellent research that they do, but because they've also been very involved in the VA in their Tobacco Cessation Clinical Resource Center treating veterans with mental health conditions who smoke. So I want to acknowledge their work. And three basic scientists, Jared Young, Jia Li, and the late Athena Marcoux, uh, whose innovative uh, drug development uh, is actually leading to improved treatments and new hope for uh, better treatments for tobacco dependence. And I want to acknowledge the work there. So our department, although I still believe this is a neglected and forgotten epidemic, certainly not related to our department. OK. so. Before I talk about the scope of the problem, I'm going to really have three goals today. Number one, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about what I view to be the dilemma or the quandary that we psychiatrists faced for about an eight-year period in the, uh, 2009 to 2017 regarding the treatment of uh, uh, tobacco dependence in individuals with psychiatric disorders. I'm going to describe the, uh, how the EAGLES trial came to be. If you don't know that study, I'll tell you a little bit about its design and its major findings. And lastly, I'm going to discuss the implications, both from a clinical perspective and also a regulatory perspective, as to the impact that the EAGLES trials has had. So the epidemic to which my title alludes is the fact that roughly half of the cigarettes being smoked in the United States these days are being consumed by individuals with psychiatric and substance use disorders. Um, that translates into about 1.3, 1 1.3 quarter billion cigarettes, and these are old data. Now with the price of 
Cigarettes gone up remarkably since the time these two surveys were done. You're talking about tens of billions of dollars, which certainly comprise a large sector of the tobacco industry's market. And um, in addition to our patients smoking at rates two to four times that of the general population, individuals with psychiatric and substance use disorders are more severely nicotine dependent. This manifests itself in having a more severe nicotine withdrawal syndrome when they do try to quit or cut down. And not surprisingly, they have lower odds of quitting. Uh, in the EAGLES trial where we carefully compared psychiatrically ill smokers with uh, non-psychiatrically ill smokers, that decrease can be as high as 55%, say, in individuals with schizophrenia. Maybe most sadly, uh, our patients are dying decades earlier, partly due to the tobacco-related diseases which they uh, 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 get afflicted with. And so if you look at the death rate in patients with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and, and, and depression, about half of the death rate is due to tobacco-related heart disease, cancer, and lung disease. Now, given the fact that our patients are more nicotine dependent and, so, and have worse nicotine withdrawal, it makes sense then that we would strongly consider using the smoking cessation medications to try to help them quit smoking. One could argue they need the medicines the most. Uh, but, of course, the dilemma we face is, number one, we only have three categories of medicines to treat this plague. Uh, we have the nicotine replacement therapies, we have bupropion, and we have vareniclin. And then soon after the release of vareniclin, the, the newest drug, and really the one drug that was specifically uh, uh, designed to target tobacco dependence, um, Reports in the media started, and to the Federal uh, F uh, Food and Drug Administration Adverse Event Reporting System, started to raise concerns about the neuropsychiatric safety of that medicine. And in addition, those medicine, the, the safety concerns also spilled over to a drug that had been on the market since 1986, bupropion. So around that time, there was a big media swirl about the negative risks of these medications, and it had a definite impact such that instead of thinking that the medicines were beneficial, many people started to think that the risks outweighed the benefits. And psychiatrists, who were already partly reluctant to intervene in smoking cessation in their patients, and other clinicians, um, actually started to retrench in their use of the medicines. And in fact, if you look back on the period from 2009 to 2013, the use of over-the-counter uh, medications, the NRTs, and the prescriptions, the non-nicotine medications, actually dropped 36% during that time period. Now, uh, what the FDA also did, in addition to putting the boxed warning on the two drugs, was to issue a post-marketing requirement to the makers of vareniclin and bupropion that said, we want you to do a very large-scale study that's going to test this phenomenon. And the, really, the study should have two aims. Number one, assess the risk of clinically significant neuropsychiatric adverse events in people who take vareniclin, bupropion, and design a study that's also going to compare it with some kind of active comparison, such as a nicotine replacement project, and make it placebo-controlled. The second aim was to be determined whether or not individuals who have psychiatric disorders differ in their risk compared with individuals who do not. And it was indeed these two aims and this mandate to the makers of Reniclin and Bupropion that led to the Eagle study. I was, of course, a smoking researcher had, after having done many studies, um, uh, had built a bit of a, of a reputation in doing these, this kind of work. But what people might not know, and it ties in with Dr. Grant's talk, is that previously I had done some work with a drug called Ramonabont, which was a CB1 blocker. And Ramonabot actually worked very well as a smoking cessation aid and as an anti-obesity drug. But it, too, fell into problems as far as its neuropsychiatric safety. So I had started actually with that drug to think about neuropsychiatric safety and was involved with a neuropsychiatric safety assessment of that compound. So when this um, PMR came out, um, I was asked to be the uh, chief uh, psychiatric consultant on the design of the study and ultimately became its principal investigator. So the EAGLES trial, a quick show of hands, how many have heard of EAGLES? Just raise your hand. 
Okay, pretty good. The EAGLES trial is an acronym, sort of, for evaluating adverse events in a global smoking cessation study. It's the largest uh, placebo-controlled smoking cessation pharmacotherapy trial ever done. Um, it was double-blind, randomized. Uh, we used uh, an active comparator of nicotine patch and, and also a, a placebo arm. Used a triple dummy design, 140 centers. UC San Diego, our Pacific Treatment and Research Center, was one of those sites. And what we did was we enrolled a large number of individuals both with and without psychiatric disorders. There were roughly 1,000 subjects per treatment arm. And we balanced the psychiatric cohort across the four treatments by the primary psychiatric diagnosis. So individuals with mood disorders, anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, and the FDA also wanted a cell that included patients with bi uh, borderline personality disorder. Uh, just like you should do in your practice, we combined the medications with counseling. This is a schematic drawing of the overall study design, and I'm just gonna focus you on our two major endpoints. And I want to start because it's unusual to have a study that was really designed to have a primary safety endpoint. And when we looked at the safety endpoint, we looked at this entire period of treatment, which was 12 weeks of treatment, plus an additional 30 days after the end of treatment to see if any of the side effects might emerge uh, after uh, the end of taking the medicine. Our primary efficacy endpoint that I'm going to show you some data on today was weeks 9 to 12 continuous abstinence. This means no smoking, not even a puff, uh, uh, as also verified by expired carbon monoxide levels. Now, as I said, it was unusual and really a first of its kind to have a study that, uh, whose goal was to assess neuropsychiatric safety of psychotropic medications. So we had to create a, a, a primary safety endpoint. And this was done in consultation with the FDA. And the way we approached it was, uh, if you looked at the package insert of vareniclin and or bupropion, you saw this laundry list of all these bad things that could happen to you when you take these drugs. In fact, there were 16 of them. And what we did was we tried to design an endpoint around those 16 symptom clusters. For some of these, you might note that they also happen during the nicotine withdrawal syndrome, very commonly, right? It's not uncommon to get a little bit aggressive or irritable when you're quitting smoking. So we had to add on a clinical significance component to the endpoint. So for these four more common kinds of complaints, in order to meet the primary safety endpoint, one, to had, one had to have it at the severe level, and by severe, it significantly impacted the person's functioning. For these other 12 symptom clusters, those could occur at either the moderate or severe level. So there had to be at least some impact on the person's clinical functioning. And rolling into these 16 terms were 261 kinds of medra terms that any hint of, you know, I yelled at my wife or I, I uh, got a little bit suspicious the other day, that would trigger us probing for that neuropsychiatric complaint in the study. Oops, there we go. Here's a little bit about what the study population looked like. Uh, in short, they were chronic heavy smokers. And you can see that by the number of duration of years of smoking. They smoked over a pack per day. And a point I wanted to just highlight for you is, remember I told you that uh, psychiatrically ill smokers are more nicotine dependent than non-psychiatrically ill smokers. And you can see that based on this Fagerstrom test of cigarette dependence, which is a measure of nicotine dependent severity. There's, of course, a big range in the psychiatric cohort. Uh, the group with the highest levels of nicotine dependent severity were the schizophrenic patients who were at 6.9, uh, bipolar patients at 6.6. Our primary finding as it related to the safety endpoint is shown on this slide. And what you can see here is in the overall sample now combining uh, patients with and without psychiatric disorders, you can see that we found that roughly one in 25 individuals had some kind of a clinically significant neuropsychiatric adverse event when they were trying to quit smoking using one of these medications or a placebo. Notice, though, that there's no difference across the drugs. Vareniclin is in the teal. This kind of bluish purplish is the bupropion. This is the NRT, and the pink is the placebo. Uh, notice no difference. 
look at the group without psychiatric disorders, and by the way, everyone under had a skid done, so these people had no history whatsoever of an Axis I disorder, you can see that the rate, even among those individuals, about 2% of those people had some kind of a clinically significant neuropsychiatric adverse event when they tried to quit smoking with the smoking cessation medicines. But notice also in the psychiatric cohort, there was this threefold increase, roughly about 6% of individuals in the psychiatric cohort had some kind of moderate to severe neuropsychiatric adverse event. The primary statistical analysis that was done was to look at the risk differences between the drug group and the placebo group, and those data are shown on this slide. First, in the upper panel, you can see the non-psychiatric cohort, and these are the risk differences and the 95% confidence intervals. Interestingly, the one significant finding was an actual lower risk in varenicline compared with placebo in the non-psychiatric cohort. In the psychiatric cohort, you can see that uh, all of the 95% uh, confidence intervals span zero. So we found no significant increase in neuropsychiatric adverse events for the medicines compared with the placebo. As far as the efficacy of these medicines go, well, we know they're efficacious. Their Cochrane Database Systematic Review has been doing meta-analyses of these drugs for you know, 15, 20 years, or 30 years in the case of nicotine replacement therapy. We know they're effective. What you can see here, <coughs> excuse me, is in the non-psychiatric cohort in the left panel, the psychiatric cohort in the middle. And the basic idea here is that all three medicines, this is abstinence weeks 9 to 12, all three medicines are uh, better than placebo at helping a person achieve that initial abstinence endpoint. Uh, Veronicolin is superior to both bupropion and the patch. But also just draw your attention over to the psychiatric cohort. First thing that should jump out at you is notice the overall diminution in quit rates. This is what we said earlier, the people with psychiatric disorders who try to quit have a harder time quitting. However, notice that the odds ratios uh, for the different drugs are actually quite similar to what you see in the psychiatric, in the non-psychiatric cohort. So the good news is that all of the medicines also work in psychiatric patients, which is very good news for our field and for our patients. Now, the fun thing about EGLES is it's ongoing. Um, the Lancet article was the top line results. There have been four other studies that have been published to date and probably about another 10 that are in development right now. What I knew was going to be special about eagles is that there probably is never going to be another study done like this. And uh, what we also have assembled in the eagle sample in the psychiatric cohort is probably the largest sample of psychiatrically ill smokers that will ever be tested in a head-to-head -head comparison of the three FDA-approved medicines in a placebo-controlled trial. I'll just point you to some of the, I, I think, and these are, I just summarized real quickly some of the papers that we're writing right now. But the take-home message is, if you look at these, these are, again, odds ratios compared with placebo of the drug in, say, let's, let's take a look at the PTSD, for example. You can see that even though it doesn't, we didn't have the power to find a statistically significant difference in this sub-cohort, notice that we have very respectable odds ratios of above three um, for both varenicline and NRT. So there may be some heterogeneity among this is what we still called, the, this was an anxiety disorder when we started the study. This was DSM-4-TR. Um, and I'll just show you that for schizophrenia, which we heard about earlier this morning and uh, the, the most difficult group to treat, notice the really uh, powerful effects of all of the medicines with the varenicline being the most effective. And you should know that among the schizophrenic patients in the varenicline uh, in, the, in this trial, Less than 10% had ever been given varenicline. It was 8%. So the best medicine to treat schizophrenic individuals was being used in less than 10% of those smokers. Okay, the other uh, interesting thing about EGLES is the clinical implications it's had. It's important that we now know that these three medicines work um, and also that the side effects do occur, the, or these uh, neuropsychiatric adverse events occur, but they occur relatively infrequently. And in some of our secondary analyses, we've set out to try to identify, are there baseline characteristics that we can ask beyond a person's background of having a mental illness that might predict who is going to have such an event? And we found that 
these three pretreatment factors, having a prior history of suicidal ideation or behavior, being more anxious at the start of the study, as measured by the hospital anxiety depression scale, and being of white race, was associated with an increased risk of having one of these clinically significant neuropsychiatric adverse events. Among individuals with psychiatric disorders, being a woman, being younger, having more severe psychiatric illness or nicotine dependence were all associated risk factors. And probably the major effect of the EAGLES trial is the regulatory impact it's had internationally. Uh, in December of 2016, um, the FDA uh, decided to remove the box around the neuropsychiatric safety warning for both bupropion and varenicline. Uh, soon thereafter, the European Medicines Agency removed its black triangle, uh, which it uses. It's the equivalent of a box warning in the, EM, in the European Union. Uh, Health Canada, Israel, and France also changed the package inserts for these medicines. So um, to conclude, I just wanted to, to give you one example of, uh, of uh, what's been about 10 years of my life. Uh, doing the EAGLES trial, which is still fun to be doing now, writing the papers is probably the most fun. And um, uh, I think when you think about the impact it's had, I'm reminded of an of a equation that my colleague Xu Hang Zhu, who runs our California Smokers Helpline and is over at the Cancer Center, Moore's Cancer Center, Xu Hang talks about the impact of a treatment as a product of the uh, treatment's efficacy and its reach. And I think what's most important about EAGLES is that it has the potential to improve the reach of our medicines, that we will not be as reluctant to intervene into in tobacco dependence in, in, our, in our patients who, um, in some ways, uh, carry the deepest burden uh, from their smoking and tobacco dependence. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>